For more than 30 years, the Hubble Space Telescope has been our eyes on the universe. Its life extended thanks to the help of the Space Shuttle. But as that program came to an end, the question remained, what do we do with Hubble? The result? STS-125 and Hubble Servicing Mission 4. As we reach 15 years since the mission, what did the crew of 7 do to keep Hubble running? Why was a second space shuttle ready to launch at the same time? And what happens to Hubble now that the space shuttle is retired? Launched in 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope started off with a serious defect. It was nearsighted. We have a whole video about the issue that you should check out, but it resulted in the first Hubble repair mission. STS-61 completed servicing mission 1, which installed CoStar to help the telescope see clearly. While engineers never planned for entire instruments to be removed from it, Hubble continued to get smarter and sharper. Servicing mission 2 visited in 1997, adding a new spectrometer. Then, Hubble was hit with failing gyroscopes, which normally help keep it pointed at its targets. In fact, half of them had failed. That saw the launch of servicing mission 3A in 1999. Not only were the gyros replaced, the crew upgraded the computers and electronics in anticipation of the next mission, servicing mission 3B. Three years later, Columbia visited and installed the first new instrument since that second servicing mission. The Advanced Camera for Surveys, or ACS, doubling the view of the wide field camera already on board and bringing Hubble into the 21st century. The mission also upgraded its solar panels to more effective ones. Then came disaster as the crew of STS-107 Columbia was lost on re-entry. That led to the announcement of the retirement of the space shuttle program. With the planned end date of 2010 at the time, Hubble engineers wanted one final chance to visit the telescope and prepare it for a future where the date of the next servicing mission, if any, was unknown. Atlantis received the honors and teams prepared to launch STS-125, also known as Hubble Servicing Mission 4, originally planned for 2008. NASA called this, quote, Hubble's most challenging and intense servicing mission with dozens of tasks to perform and only five spacewalks to do it. The plan? Everything you see scrolling next to me. That includes installing two new instruments, removing older ones from the telescope, upgrading power supplies, computers, gyroscopes, and repairing two science instruments that were never designed to be repaired in orbit. In fact, one of the instruments required more than 100 screws to be removed. If even one came loose, it could damage Hubble and render either some instruments or the entire telescope useless. Stay tuned to see the creative solution they came up with. As NASA approached launch in September of 2008, a malfunction occurred in one of the systems that commands the science instruments on board the telescope and helps direct that flow of data within Hubble. With an uncertain future for Hubble, NASA wasn't going to leave it without a backup, thus delaying the launch to May of 2009. And that wasn't the only precaution. Check this out. NASA literally had two space shuttles on two pads. Why? Well, following the Columbia disaster, crews regularly checked for damage from falling external tank foam. If there was serious damage, most missions could dock to the ISS and wait out their time until a lifeboat could come return them home. Hubble was in a nearly 350 mile orbit, inclined 28.5 degrees. The ISS was about 250 miles, inclined 51.6 degrees. To put that into English, they were nowhere close to each other. So what happens if Atlantis was damaged? That's when STS-400 would have launched. The next shuttle up, Endeavour, my favorite, was placed on LC-39B, ready and waiting to launch if something were to go wrong. The rescue plan was quite wild. With a limited crew of four, Endeavour would have arrived at the stricken shuttle before Atlantis grappled onto Endeavour via the robotic arm. The two orbiters, facing payload bay to payload bay, would use the robotic arms as a connection between the two vehicles, 
eventually stringing a long wire between them, which the crew of seven would use to board Endeavor. Meanwhile, a piece of hardware would be installed on Atlantis to allow the ground to send a command for a disposal burn of the crippled Atlantis. Extra seats would be ready for the increased crew on Endeavor. The largest crew aboard a single shuttle was eight. This would have seen a crew of 11. Thankfully, it wasn't needed, and Endeavor sat by as Atlantis soared on May 11, 2009 for one final shuttle Hubble rendezvous. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, the final visit to enhance the vision of Hubble into the deepest grandeur of our universe. Following a day of checking Atlantis' tiles for damage using a special tool called the Orbiter Boom Sensor System, or OBSS, and a couple of Ohm's engine burns, Atlantis had Hubble in sight. Megan MacArthur got the honor of grappling Hubble with the shuttle's cannon arm and attaching it to a special platform inside the payload bay where it would stay until repairs were completed. With the tight schedule and the demanding workload, the crews working during each spacewalk would rotate allowing them some breaks in between EVAs. The first spacewalk saw John Grunsfeld and Drew Feustel replacing one of the most famous cameras, Wide Field Camera 2, taking well-known photos like the Pillars of Creation that you see here. In its place, Wide Field Camera 3. Mainly looking in UV and infrared, it produced a much wider view with higher sensitivity than the older camera, which was actually brought back to Earth and placed in the Smithsonian, so you can see it today. Also added, a low impact docking system. That would allow an uncrewed spacecraft to dock that would then help deorbit Hubble near the end of its life. However, there may be another use for it, but we'll get to that shortly, keep that in mind. Spacewalk 2 saw Hubble getting new gyros and new batteries thanks to Mike Massimino and Michael Bueno Good. The next new instrument came on the third spacewalk, the Cosmic Origins Spectrograph, the most sensitive ultraviolet spectrograph ever planned to fly. This took the slot formerly belonging to CoStar, which, as we mentioned, was the original fix for Hubble's nearsightedness when it first launched. A newer version was installed during repairs in 2002 on Mission 3B, rendering it obsolete, allowing for the swap to the new science instrument in its place. Now repairs were required to two instruments, which were never designed to be fixed in orbit. The first of those came on this EVA, fixing the advanced camera for surveys, one of the main visible light cameras. In fact, this camera took the famous Hubble Ultra Deep Field picture, which gave us a true scale of the universe. The crew used custom-made tools to remove an access panel and replace the camera's four circuit boards, plus install a new power supply. As a result, all but one instrument aboard ACS came back to life. The real struggles came on the fourth spacewalk and the fixes to the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, which had failed five years earlier due to a blown power supply. To get to the instrument, Massimino and Good would have to remove four handles and more than 100 screws that, again, were never meant to be removed in space. Three of the four handles came off easily. The last one had a strip bolt on the bottom, which prevented it from coming off. So, after ground testing, the call came up to the spacewalkers. Mike would have to yank the handle off. Yeah, Andrew, just uh, before we get into it, uh, I just want to give you a little bit more information. This was just done just now at Goddard um, on a uh, basically a flight equivalent unit, and it took 60 pounds linear at the top of the handhold to, to fail the single bolt in the lower right position at the bottom. Okay, Mass, you copy that. 60 yep. pounds linear at the top of the handrail to bust off that bottom bolt. I, I think you've got that in you. I can try. So what do we do? Just give me the steps. And yank he did. Planet Houston, we don't have video right now, but uh, we're ready. Okay, Mass, you have a go. go. So, dispose the back, please. Okay. Easy, easy, Mike. Just real easy, okay? 
And with that, they can move on to the tiny screws. With screws that small in a zero-g environment, losing one and damaging Hubble was a real risk. That's where the specially designed fastener capture plate came into use. All 111 small screws and washers were removed and held between the box cover and the capture plate. So none floated away, allowing for the repair of the spectrograph. Then came the last ever spacewalk to fix Hubble, which installed a second battery module, a refurbished fine guidance sensor, new thermal blankets where the current ones had degraded, and small final quality of life improvements. After five spacewalks, Hubble was released by the space shuttle one last time. A tour de force of tools and human ingenuity. This mission in particular, as Arthur C. Clarke says, the only way of finding the limits of the possible is by going beyond them into the impossible. And on this mission, we tried some things that many people said was impossible, fixing stiff, repairing ACS, achieving all the content that we have in this mission. But we've achieved that, and we wish Hubble the very best. I want to wish Hubble its own set of adventures, and with the new instruments we've installed, that it may unlock further mysteries of the universe. STS-125 landed safely at Edwards Air Force Base in California after 14 days in space, leaving Hubble all alone. Will it ever be visited again by people? Turns out, there's a chance. Remember that docking adapter I mentioned? Well, Jared Isaacman, who has flown on Inspiration4 and will fly aboard Polaris Dawn, has proposed using a SpaceX Dragon capsule to rendezvous with and dock to Hubble using the equipment installed on STS-125. He believes they could raise the spacecraft's orbit, extending its life, and even possibly conducting more repairs. The proposal also included the possibility of using Starship to bring Hubble home rather than burning up during a controlled re-entry. Isaacman actually talked to NSF about the plan recently. This is not the, uh you know, multi, multi, multi billion dollar asset, you know, kid gloves of, you know, 30 years ago, you know, 20 years ago. So it's coming home uh, at some point or another. It's either coming home uncontrolled where there's going to be some, some, you know, small risk to person or property, or you're going to spend like stupid amounts of money to go up and make it a controlled re-entry. You do an EVA, you know, there's a, there's a lot of risk in that. It's like, we're doing an EVA on Polaris 2, guaranteed. We will evolve the capabilities from what we learned from Polaris 1. So that risk is being taken no matter what. Do you want, you know, this amazing asset to just be healthier when we put it into a higher orbit or not? If you can kick that, that bad boy up and give it another 10 or 15 more years of, of life, it is totally within the realm of possible to go up and bring it down on a starship. Everybody who's a naysayer today because of whether it's, you know, their own, you know, protecting their own personal contributions or whatnot to that telescope can take their grandkids and see it in the Smithsonian. For now, Hubble continues to observe and teach us about our place in the stars. But what do you think? Should we try and fix Hubble? Or is it time to potentially bring it home after a life well served? Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget, you can find so many pictures, videos, and documents relating to STS-125 and Hubble in the NSF L2 forums, some of which haven't seen the light of day in years, if ever. I'm Sawyer Rosenstein. Later, nerds.